I am very pleased to welcome you today to our uh, Zoom uh, book lounge uh, of a book by Ayala Fader, Hidden Heretics, Jewish Doubt in the Digital Age. As the title suggests, it's in the digital age. So uh, I, uh, it is probably not surprising we are doing it, or maybe not so bad we're doing it on Zoom. Um, so uh, let me introduce Ayala, the speakers, and then we'll ha uh, ha I'll ha uh, hand it over to them. So Ayala Fader received her PhD from NYU and is currently professor of anthropology at Fordham University. She's the author of the award-winning book, Mitzvah Girls, Bringing Up the Next Generation of Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn, which was published by Princeton University Press in 2009, and uh, she won the National Jewish Book Award for that book. Her recent fellowships include the National Science Foundation and the National Endowment for hum the Humanities. In support of her latest book, uh, which we're discussing today, Hidden Heretics, Jewish Doubt in the D Digital Age. Ayala Fader is the co-founder and co-convener of the new uh, of the New York uh, Working Group on Jewish Orthodoxies at Fordham Center for Jewish Studies. Her um, uh, interlocutor is um, uh, Professor Robert Orsi, who is the Grace Craddock uh, Nagel Chair of Catholic Studies at Northwestern University, where he's also Professor of Jewish, of, I'm sorry, of Religious Studies, History and American Studies. Professor Orsi studies modern and contemporary religion with a special focus on Catholic pra practices and ideas from both historical and ethnographic perspectives. He also researches and writes on theory and method on the study of religion. He's a member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has been recipient of, fellowship, recipient of fellowships from the NEH to the Guggenheim. His books include Madonna of 115th Street, Faith and Community in Italian Harlem, 1880, uh, 1959. Thank you, St. Jude, Women's Devotion to the Patron Saint of Hopeless Causes, and Between Heaven and Earth, Religious Worlds, uh, People Makeup, and Scholars Who Study Them. His most recent book is History and Presence, which was published by Belknap Imperv of Harvard University Press in 2016. So I hope you'll, jo uh, you'll join us also for other events and I'm now handing it over to our, uh, our speakers. Thank you. Ayala, are you there? Uh, yeah, I am. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see anything. Is this going Hold to be- Hold on, now I'm, I'm, okay. Okay. Can you see me? Yes, you can. But you can't see me. No, we can't see you. You have to un-, un... I can't. You oh, have... I have to, I'm sorry. Wait, Magda, can you help us do that? Hold on, I think I can undo it. Uh, You're the host now, so yeah. yeah I'm going to make you the host too, and um, you can unmute yourself. You can make your picture. Great. Good. Okay. Great. All right. <laughs> Technical difficulties aside, Bob, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, I want to thank you so much, Magda, for organizing this book book launch. I'm really grateful to Fordham Jewish Studies and Princeton University Press for co-hosting. I want to give a shout out also to my private at-home production agency. Um, <laughs> I'm so thrilled to have Bob Orsi joining me, um, whose work has really inspired my own. And I'm most grateful of all to all of you for joining me today, especially 
and perhaps despite the dark times that we find ourselves in our country and in the world. Um, I'm going to begin today's program with a short reading from Hidden Heretics. It's the story of Yisrael, which is a pseudonym. Um, then Bob and I are going to have a conversation, um, and then we'll throw the floor open to all of you, and I'm happy to take questions and have a discussion. Okay? So, let me just share my screen with you for a second. Now I have to be the host. Damn. Can you make me the host, Bob? Put me back as the host? Uh, really? Like go in the, the thing on the top right? Go Sorry. The, the thing on the top right, what thing on the Yeah, top? see those little dots? Those little the dots. The blue box? Oh yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, mute my audio, stop video, pin, stop, rename, edit, uh, doesn't look like that's where it happens. No. Um, hold on one second. Let me see. Um, it looks like I'm not going to share my screen. Well, okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm reading from my book now. <laughs> All right. Um, so Yisrael was an earnestly pious boy growing up Hasidic in Brooklyn, New York. With his side curls grazing his shoulders, thick plastic glasses, and big black velvet yarmulke, he looked like all the other boys in his yeshiva, where he studied the Torah and its commentaries from early in the morning until late at night. But when he was 13, Yisrael began to notice contradictions that troubled him in the religious texts he was studying. He didn't initially doubt the truth of ultra-Orthodox Judaism, but he had problematic questions, what are called in Yiddish amunakashas, or questions of faith. Only once did he timidly confide in his teacher, a rabbi, who angrily warned him that such questions came from the sin of masturbation. From then on, confused and ashamed, he kept his questions to himself um, and tried, as he told me, to push them under the rug. At 18, he got married, and he and his wife, Ruchi, whom he barely knew but grew to adore, had five children in quick succession. To support his growing family, Yisrael eventually stopped studying Torah and began, as many Hasidic men do, to work in information technology. However, in 2003, when he was 29, his questions began to nag at him again. And this time, thanks to his work with computers, he turned to the internet, secretly searching for and reading forbidden scholarly articles on theology, biblical criticism, and science. He hoped to finally find answers to his questions about faith, in these non-Jewish sources, but they only provoked more questions. He decided then, he told me, that he had to take his questioning all the way. Late at night, sitting alone in the kitchen, after everyone had gone to bed, he began reading some of the then popular heretical ultra-Orthodox blogs. These led him to online forums of the day, where writing under a pseudonym in Yiddish and in English, Yisrael debated with ultra-Orthodox Jewish doubters, and even some who had openly left Jewish Orthodoxy altogether to go OTD or off the derech, off the path. He tried to convince them and himself that they were wrong. All of his searching, he told me, remembering his anguish tortured him, but he could not stop. Eventually, his questions gave way to doubt in the central premise of ultra-Orthodox Jewish authority, that God revealed the Torah to the Jews at Mount Sinai through Moses. Yisrael was in such agony at this heresy that he secretly began to make phone calls to consult rabbis outside of his community who specialized in answering questions of faith. Their arguments failed to convince him. Despite continuing to observe the mitzvahs, the 613 prohibitions and commandments that had always directed every aspect of his life, he began to doubt their divine truth. The first time he ever violated one of the commandments was on a Sabbath evening in 2012. His youngest was crying, and he knew that turning on the musical mobile above her crib would calm her down. Observant Jews do not turn electricity on or off during the Sabbath. He stood alone in the dark with his hand on the switch for a long time. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and then he switched it on. Each time he broke another commandment, like using his phone on Shabbos or skipping daily prayers, he told me he felt a sense of freedom, finally able to be in control of his life. And that was when he became one of the growing number of what most ultra-Orthodox call in English double life, or ITC, in the closet, 
or what Yiddish-speaking ultra-Orthodox called Bahal Tanapi Korsim, hidden heretics. Men and women who practiced religiously in public, including at home, but who often violated the commandments in secret because they no longer believed them to be God's words to his chosen people. Yisrael and others like him kept their double lives secret to protect their families and for fear of being cast out in a world they were ill-prepared to navigate. And then in 2014, his wife Ruchi finally confronted him. She had noticed in the intimacy of their bedroom that he had stopped washing Nagelwasser, the ritual hand washing upon waking up each morning. She asked him if he still prayed, if he kept the Sabbath. Did he still believe? Hiding in their bedroom and closet and whispering late at night so their children wouldn't hear, he told her everything. And then just a few months later, the Vad Hatznias, the Committee on Modesty, a group of self-appointed activists and rabbis contacted Yisrael through his brother-in-law. They somehow knew that he had just bought a book on science from Amazon for his 12-year-old daughter, which included a section on the theory of evolution, which Hasidic Jews reject. Yisrael's world was literally falling apart, and that was when I met him through a mutual contact. He told me his story as it was unfolding. And then with, his, with her permission, he gave me Ruchi's number, and I began to talk to her too, on the phone and on Facebook. Ruchi, who used to rely on her husband for spiritual guidance, told me how his doubt had begun to affect her, how she worried about her own faith glitching or slipping, and about her new sense of responsibility for the Ruchnias or the spirituality in their home, traditionally the authority of the husband. Yisrael's secret was hers now too. She could tell no one, not even her family. And she told me she was scared, angry, and heartbroken all at once. The Committee on Modesty wanted Yisrael to sign a contract promising he would stop using any social media, part of the growing effort by the ultra-Orthodox to control the internet and protect the community from what was increasingly called a crisis of amina or a crisis of faith. Then the committee threatened to expel Yisrael's children from school and to tell his parents unless he and Ruchi agreed to see a religious therapist, someone who worked with a rabbi and then reported back to the committee. Some ultra-Orthodox Jews believed that religious doubt might be symptomatic of an underlying mental illness, perhaps depression, a trauma, anxiety, or something that could be treated and cured. Afraid, Yisrael and Ruchi tried a number of different therapists and religious, religious and secular, but none helped him regain his faith. What Yisrael called his journey was still unfolding. Would he and his wife stay together? And if they did, would her faith continue to slip? Would the religious authorities and institutions be able to control the decisions he and his wife made? Would they expel his children, which would have serious repercussions for the entire family, especially when it came time for match ma matchmaking? Where did his responsibilities as a parent lie, especially as his children got older? Those living double lives are part of a broader 21st century generational crisis of authority. Despite their robust demographic growth, there have been increasingly loud struggles over competing knowledge and truths. The internet facilitated the formation of a public oppositional voice, one that included anonymous expressions of life-changing doubt and validated radically changing perceptions of oneself in the world. Gender was key to the experience of and possibilities for living double lives since gender structures authority in both ultra-Orthodox life and its alternative public. Begun in online spaces, but soon crossing over to meetings in person, this alternative public gave a platform to dangerous questions. Who should have the authority for making life choices? What and who defined Orthodox Judaism or self-fulfillment or an ethical life? The pages ahead ask what double lifers everyday struggles can tell us about religious doubt and social change in the digital age. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a fabulous story to start with, uh, Ella, uh, because um, so many of the themes of this, this rich book uh, are, are in that story, and I'm, it's a great way to start. Uh, let me say how happy I am to be here to thank you for this invitation. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be talking to you like this, even though we're separated by uh, half a country um, right now. Um, and thank you also to Fordham's Center for uh, Jewish Studies that, for making this possible. So I thought I would start um, by asking you one of the key concepts of the book. You, you say the book is about, it's, you, you say the book offers an anthropology of life-changing doubt. Uh, and that's, I think, a very special phrase for you, life-changing doubt. So wh what do you mean by li life-changing doubt and what are you distinguishing it from uh, in, in that phrase? 
Thank you, Bob. Yeah, that's that's kind of one of the real key questions here. So I would say, first of all, that doubt is inherent to all religious life. Doubt in some ways defines and refines faith. I think doubt is expected in for all religious believers. It ebbs and flows over the life cycle. This kind of doubt remains usually in individual interiors. It doesn't disrupt religious practice. My focus in Hidden Heretics is what I've called life-changing doubt. Um, and it's the doubt that refused to stay inside people, and it did lead to the disruption or the eventual stopping of religious practice. Um, I think most often this kind of life-changing doubt makes people leave, but those living double lives couldn't or they wouldn't. They were imbricated in families and extended families, and they sometimes didn't feel prepared to leave. So they stayed, which meant that they kept this dramatic change, changing worldview, a secret. Um, but Secret life-changing doubt rarely stays inside individuals, and I think that's what makes it distinctive. And so many began in the early 2000s and mid-2000s to go online and to find each other, and they began creating networks of doubters, and those spilled over into face-to-face -face relationships too, so that there were whole networks of people. I don't think life-changing doubt is anything new, but I think the internet actually facilitated this new kind of community that could remain and still um, find each other and not, and not um, feel so isolated. I would say too that life-changing doubt has real familial in the sense and communal implications. So that even when it's um, kept secret, it affects spouses, for example, and children. And over the time that I was doing field work, um, it drew increasing attention from religious leadership, from activists and therapists, and lots of other people who tried to help people regain their faith. Uh, I think one of the one of the most powerful things about your book actually is exactly that point that, that this is internal. This is an internal experience that is coming out in lots of different ways. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that pressure outwards? I I, I came to see it as uh, in the in the book. I was really amazed at how many ways doubt was expressed in clothing in in uh, very subtle, subtle, but nonetheless pretty pervasive ways of expressing this doubt. So it found expression. Yeah, um, and I, I would say in their public ultra-Orthodox lives that people continue to lead, I was surprised, or maybe not so surprised, but it found expression in very minute ways. Um, in some ways, it seemed to me like people living double lives sort of pushed the envelope of appropriateness uh -huh. just enough to stay in their communities. They use their bodies, they use language, they use clothing. So for example, a very common thing that I heard again and again was a, women would tell me that they stopped shaving under their wigs, something that very few people see except maybe the mikvah lady and their husbands. Um, and some women change stockings from very thick beige stockings to a lighter stocking. Um, men sometimes would wear a cardigan instead of their long black coat, or they would pull out their beards a little bit because they weren't allowed to cut them. Um, men's English often got better because suddenly they were reading secular books and, and their Yiddish changed too as they began to go online and write about their own experiences in Yiddish. But if these kinds of changes were too fast or too dramatic, people in their community notice because these are significant semiotic markers. So for example, some woman, uh, one woman living a double life told me when she took her hat off of her wig, which is a very big step that you don't take alone, her neighbor came up to her and said, is everything okay? Can I help you? So people are watching and, and noticing. Um, and I think people made those small changes in their everyday lives um, in order to feel like their insides, perhaps their changing interiors matched their outsides. But in their secret lives, the lives that they explored with other people living double lives or those who had gone off the derech, who had left their communities, I would say there was a kind of mashup of ultra-Orthodox sensibilities and their imagining of what secular life was. So people experimented with all kinds of things um, really often actually around the Jewish calendar. So before or after a Jewish holiday or you know, after they had fulfilled their family responsibilities, I went to a lot of parties. There were, I think especially men were sort of trying to reclaim this adolescence that they had never um, experienced. There was drinking, people went, men and women together went to bars. Um, I actually often got home 
very late to the shock of my teenage kids. Um, there was a lot of experimenting also with their bodies. So, you know, people, one of the markers often was learning to ride a bike, renting city bikes and practicing riding a bike, something that many Hasidic and some yeshivish, but more Hasidic Jews don't do. There were experiments in skiing, you know, away from, from eyes who could judge. Lots of online exploration of books and intellectual groups with men and women. And sometimes um, groups of men or women explored Jewish New York too. They went to Fiddler on the Roof when that was out. Um, God from uh, God from Nakama, uh, Nakama, the God of Vengeance was playing for a while, a Yiddish play, and many went to that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I want to ask, ask you more about the internet in a second, which is key to your book. But if, uh, first, your the, the that image of you coming home later than your <laughs> teenage children expected raises a question about uh, ethnography and what the ethnographic experience was like doing this book. Um, I, I, I've always been really in awe of your ethnographic uh, chops, but I think <laughs> chops is the wrong word. You have, there's a grace and an elegance to the way you both write about ethnography and I sense the way you do it. Can, can you say something a little bit about the challenges of this ethnographic project? Sure. Um, yeah, this ethnographic project, which in some ways is a kind of continuation of my interest in ultra-orthodoxy was really different from my first project. In my first project, I talked really exclusively to women and girls um, and maybe little boys too. But in this project, I found myself talking to a lot of men, which was interesting and um, took, me, took me a little while to get used to. Um, but I think one of the most challenging aspects of this project was the imperative to keep secrets myself. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, the more I spent time with people living double lives, the more who, who were actually very open and seemed to want to tell their stories to me. Um, I think there was some had known some knew me already from my first book. They were um, they had read it and being autodidacts, they were they were interested to talk to somebody who was an academic. I think maybe for some it was helpful to sort of narrate the whole arc of their story too in a very open way with no consequences. Um, but I had to be very, very careful to keep people's secrets. And sometimes that was hard for me since so much of ethnography is building like, this person tells me this, what do you think about this? Or so-and-so suggested I talk to you. So I had to actually learn how to keep secrets. And some of the access that I had with people living double lives was much more challenging actually when I realized that I had to also talk to the people who tried, the ultra-Orthodox faithful who tried to help those living double lives. So some of the life coaches and rabbis and sort of outreach rabbis were much less, were much more reluctant to talk to me, I would say, which surprised me. I, I thought it would be the reverse. It was, it was, I had a lot of access to therapists who were curious about my own ethnography. There's a lot of overlap there, you know, um, in what creates religious doubt. But um, I would say it was especially challenging to find public, to find places where I could do participant observation. Um, and, and that's what I feel is the real heart of ethnography in a lot of ways. But because so many of the activities that people were doing were secret and online, I had to find spaces where I could move beyond interviews. So I started with interviews actually, and that was the way that I tried to build trust. Once in a while I made mistakes and, and didn't keep people's secrets as well as I should. And I had to, to learn from those errors. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually people began inviting me to um, events that I could join. And that's, I think, where you get a lot of parallels between what people are saying and what they're doing, which is what ethnography is all about. Uh, there's so many, there's so many rich uh, topics to explore here, but I, I want to get right away to the internet before uh, I'm trying to keep track of our time. Uh, people go off the derrick uh, uh, and onto the internet, it seems, uh, or somewhere along the line, onto the internet is almost as important. I was really struck. I have to say, uh, I was uh, pretty surprised by the idea that seems current, uh, at least among those in among the ultra orthodox who are most anxious about the internet that the fr the idea that the internet is more dangerous uh, than the Holocaust is is really a striking observation. Can, can you say something about I guess one question I would ask is do you think, what do you think the role of the internet is in radical doubt? Does it cause it? Does it exacerbate it? What 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 is the internet and radical doubt? 
Yeah. Um, so I would say, I would begin by saying in general, the ultra Orthodox have not really been, don't really reject new technologies out of hand. That hasn't been what they do since they came at least after World War II. As long as they could redeem a new medium or a new technology by infusing it with Jewish content or Jewish form. So for example, cassettes, when they first came out, cassette tapes, everyone remembers what those are, were not very kosher at first, but now they're incredibly kosher because they've been infused with lots of Jewish content. TV was much more difficult to control, and so that was censored. But of course, the internet can't be censored because so many businesses rely on that, and it really organizes contemporary life. So what I think is that the internet, really over this past decade, um, because before this past decade, the internet was not taken quite so seriously. And I think it's this past decade that it somehow became a flashpoint for, um, for a wider crisis of authority, which is really about political leadership and economic challenges and a generational tension too, um, who don't want to live by such stringent interpretations of Jewish law. So, the book actually toggles back and forth between different perspectives on the internet. And I think that's really important and how those change over time. I would say that double people living double lives were always quick to tell me that it didn't create their life changing doubt that in fact, it was going sneaking into public libraries and reading um, that, that, that sparked their doubt. Maybe young, the younger generation, the internet is more, is, is more implicated in that. But for a whole generation, that wasn't the case. What the internet did do was it saved them from thinking they were crazy or thinking they were alone. And in that way, the internet was really part of the formation of what I'm calling a heretical counter public. But for rabbinic leadership, um, there was a change over that same decade where they went from blaming the content of the internet, which was they called schmutz or schmitz, um, as in porn, dirt, right? That's, they moved from that blaming the content to blaming the medium itself and suggesting that that, especially smartphones, could be corrupting. And I, 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 I'll return now to what you asked about the Holocaust. They, many called this in there, they had many um, rallies against the internet with, you know, thousands and thousands of people separate from men and women, but they called it, many rabbis called it the challenge of their generation. And they compared it to other challenges to Jewish Orthodox existence, such as the Holocaust, but they also compared it to the Spanish Inquisition or when Jews were slaves in Egypt. So in that way, they created their own temporality, really, where from the uh, revelation at Mount Sinai, they become the keepers, really, of, of Jewish truth and Jewish orthodoxies. So then in response to that, and in fact, I, I think I mentioned too that there, I found a poster that says the Holocaust burned our bodies, but the internet burns our souls. And so that in a way is a kind of turning again to a concern with interiority. But once they defined the internet as this threat, the leadership began to require filters and they tied that to the school system, the most us. Um, and in a way they were able to begin to really um, require that people filter their phones men refused to give up their smartphones. And so the next phase of that um, kind of rabbinic appeal was to work with women in particular and try to convince them to turn in their smartphones and get kosher flip phones that only uh, made fall calls um, and to tell women in a way, giving them a new kind of authority that they were the protectors of their home and they had to keep the internet out of their homes. Wow, the Spanish Inquisition, the, Egypt, and the Holocaust, that puts the internet in some, in, in some truly dreadful company um, yes. in terms of how it's imagined in its, in its role. Um, at the very end there, you say that it, you give the image of, uh, of the rabbis one step ahead of changing, or one step behind changing technologies. They're always catching up with the, the I, I don't know, from their perspective, I'm sure the deviousness of the technology yeah. Uh, but you said they turn to women. Uh, that raises the question of gender and doubt, because uh, it's a very powerful theme in your book yeah. that, that doubt is experienced, expressed, encountered very differently by men and women in this community. Um, can, you, can you speak to that issue as well? Yeah, yeah, that's really central. Um, and as I said, you know, when I first started doing this field work, I, I only talked to men, and then I began to wonder, like, 
why am I only talking to men? Aren't there women living double lives too? Um, and what I sort of decided over a long period of time, and I, I did meet a number of double life women, but men and women, have, first of all, there are structural factors that really shape the ability to lead a double life. So at the point of marriage, when 18, 19, 20, men and women have different experiences completely. So uh, a young man who gets married after he's married has an incredible amount, not incredible, but who has much more independence. He has his own home now. He often has mobility for going out. There are structural times where he can be outside the home socializing. For a young woman, the point of marriage is the time where she really goes from being quite independent as an older teen to then being the person who's home. Hopefully she has a large family and she's home taking care of the kids. Um, it, some places upstate women don't, aren't allowed to drive, but the very fact is that they don't have the kind of mobility that men have and their socializing is really done out of the home with extended family. Um, one of, so those are the structural factors. Experientially, um, it seemed to me that men who had life-changing doubt were really sad, they were devastated. They were, as Yisrael said, tortured. They were in anguish at the kind of loss of belief. Some women experienced that too, but a number of them also told me that they were angry. They were angry that they had given up certain things that they wanted, be it intellectual, a certain intellectual life, a certain kind of religiosity for what they believed to be true. And once they decided it wasn't true, they were angry that they had given that up. And the flip side of that too, is that um, for the explanations that the faithful made for life-changing doubt for men and women, those were also different. So men were often, um, they had an intellectual kind of, um, intellectual historical um, model for doubters. You know, there, there were many well-known um, doubters throughout Jewish history. Um, Spinoza being the least of them, right? Um, but so they actually, when you say that, right? Yeah. Spinoza, right. <laughs> um, but they called themselves sometimes maskilim, which are Jewish enlighteners, hearkening back to the Jewish enlightenment. Yeah. Women didn't have that role, and so a lot of women who were exposed or who confessed to their husband, people said that there were emotional reasons for their life changing it out. They said that intellectual reasons were not true or were not really what was at the heart of the matter, and so they blamed emotional um, problems or troubles. Um, Nomi Seidman has written about her own leaving of her community. She's a Jewish studies scholar and she writes very eloquently, I hoped I was a philosopher, not a whore, right? And so that is the kind of the, the tension there. I would say too that um, women who were living double lives told me how frightened they were that if their husbands divorced them, they would lose kids in custody battles. Something that I think men weren't quite as worried about um, although some were, of course. And then for the still religious spouses, um, I think some of the consequences were more difficult for women too, if they were the still religious spouses, because they had to suddenly become the religious authorities in their homes. And that wasn't something that many of them welcomed. And as Ruchi did, um, they had to keep their husband's secrets and lie for them too. Your story about women, you're uh, mentioning women fearful that they would lose custody really underscores the cost of doubting. I, I, I don't mean to, uh, it, would be a, it would be a misrepresentation, I think, of modernity to say that doubt is easy anywhere. I mean, I think in evangelical Christian communities and Catholic communities, you know, whatever communities, doubt is a hard thing. And but I was struck as I read you by the very, very, I mean, Spinoza's, a, I guess, Spinoza's life story is a kind of precursor of this, but the very serious consequences of doubting, including, and, I, and one of the things you're so careful about is to show how over time, the community's interpretation of doubt changes. So it goes from immorality to almost insanity. Uh, um, but among the among the terrible costs of doubt is in fact the danger of being designated mentally sick. Yeah, um, it's interesting because in some ways, um, in some ways that's that's better to be designated having emotional troubles because for both the person doubting, although not experiencing that obviously, but for the person doubting and for the extended families because that is an excuse that has a biological 
explanation. It's not uh, a spiritual it's explanation. Not, it's more ethical, right? Yeah, yeah, more ethical. And I think, um, I think in some ways, and it's definitely not all communities who, who go toward um, blaming mental health issues, but I will say that I think having that life kind of life changing doubt is actually a trauma to a person. And it wouldn't be surprising for someone to feel depressed and anxious and, and actually have a hard time, um, you know, getting through everyday life because that is a trauma and keeping those secrets are a real burden too. And the kind of ethical struggles that people went through were so painful that there are also mental health issues. And many people told me that it was really helpful for them. Once they found a good mm -hmm. therapist, religious mm -hmm. or secular, it could be very, very helpful for them when they negotiated with their still religious spouse, for example, when they had family therapy. Um, and so a good therapist was often um, something that was shared among people living double lives too. There are some therapists, I think, and I, it's again, few, but I heard it, repeated enough times that there were some therapists who were perhaps too invested in keeping people within the fold. And that kind of tension between helping someone or keeping them in, and, and again, it's about personal autonomy in some respects. Mm -hmm. I think that could be really troubling when doubt got pathologized in that ways. But the goal was really to treat what got dragged along with that life-changing doubt. And, and therapy was very important in that well, one of the things that the medicalization or the psychologization of doubt does is it lets, it lets community leaders off the hook in a way. It lets the conditions of life in the community yes. off the hook. And we, you and I have talked about this. It's akin in my mind, the way I read your book, there's a similarity in say Catholicism, the, the emphasis was in the Catholic hierarchy in the midst of the sexual abuse crisis to locate, uh, uh, to, to render this a psychological uh, crisis, to say that it's the crisis of the pedophile or the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the perpetrator, and then of the, it's the psychological suffering of the victim. But what that does is it clouds or screens the real life political, social, institutional realities that lead to doubt. Do you, do you think that's a similar, do you see a, a, that at work in this dynamic as well? I do. And one of the things I saw, I went to a religious therapist conference, which was really interesting. And I actually went to two of them. Well, I would say two things. The first is, yes, sometimes that happens where there's, um, a, I called it a triangulation between um, a rabbi deals with ethical issues and moral issues and a therapist deals with emotional issues. So that kind of splitting, in fact, does in some ways let let religious leaders off the hook because they there's the claim that well there's something mentally wrong with them and not necessarily with the community and that's what i think a lot of double people living double lives were very critical of because they were making a critique of their own communities um but i i also saw over time that there were changes to religious therapy and um there is a small group that is promoting keeping religious, keeping ties with children who leave their communities, no matter if they do or if they don't. So putting children above religion. Hmm. I also went to um, a conference where one of the therapists who was modern Orthodox, who wasn't ultra Orthodox, but was modern Orthodox said, you know, I used to lecture that people who had religious doubt and life changing doubt and who left had some kind of trauma often sexual abuse or some kind of mental trauma. And he said, now I don't know if that's true. We just sometimes don't know. Sometimes it doesn't work for someone. So I am hopeful that some of those, um, some of those new changes are gonna actually um, perhaps make a difference and make it easier to incorporate a wider range in, the, in, in ultra orthodoxy. Which is kind of my last question. I, I'm sure there are many people who have questions and want to talk to you uh, uh, in the audience, wherever the audience is. This is such a strange experience. Uh, and and uh, so I guess uh, I'm wondering if, as I, read, as I read about the serious intellectual, moral, domestic struggles and the integrity that your sources struggled with, I mean, I came to admire them a great deal for their integrity and their courage. Uh, I'm wondering if this will change the nature of life more broadly among the ultra-Orthodox. If, for example, the question of children who leave, if there'll be a certain 
I don't, I, want, I don't want to say relaxing, but a loosening of some of the strictures so that there can be other ways of living an ultra-Orthodox life. Yeah, I, I do think so. I mean, the, the phenomenon of living a double life, there, there are very few numbers on that, and I don't know. You know, I was, I, I was quoted from 100 to 10,000, so that's unclear. I know that, that people leaving, like especially uh, teenagers going OTD and people living double lives are a big concern. Um, so that's, that's important. But I, do, I did see, actually, um, that there was a new category of ultra-Orthodoxy specifically for Hasidic Jews called Hasidic light or modern Hasidish. And that was um, a category of people often living sort of on the outskirts of certain religious neighborhoods um, where the cultural and sort of expressivity and um, religious observance, not observance, I'm sorry, but the expressivity and the sensibility was ultra Orthodox, but some of the stringencies were not quite as prevalent and there were more, maybe religious law was a little bit more lenient. Instead of going to stringency, there was lenience, but, but the sense of community and the kind of style was the same. And so it was, it was observant, but it was a little more flexible. So I too wonder, um, and I, I also end the book this way, wondering, you know, maybe, maybe in this now fourth and fifth generation of, of ultra-Orthodox here, at least in the States, maybe there is a kind of relaxing a little bit, not lessening of observance, but in terms of who says what observance should be. Hmm, right. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop now and let Magda uh, uh, who, uh, take questions. Is that yes. how it goes? Will it, yes, yes. So we'll, try to, we'll try to take as many questions as possible. Uh, so uh, the first question is about uh, the numbers. Since you're talking about numbers and whether you don't know. So the question is, Deborah Feldman, unorthodox, indicates that perhaps up to 20% of the ultra-orthodox community would leave if they could. 90% of those who leave are men, and the women who leave can only do so as a last resort. Is this your experience? And I think it ties also to, um, to another question about the importance of marriage and keeping children and, and whether that makes people more or less uh, uh, able to leave uh, married or unmarried. Yeah, I'm gonna start with the second part first. Definitely, I think getting married young um, and having children does keep people in the community. I mean, the people that I was spending time with didn't want to hurt their families. They didn't want to hurt their kids. They knew there'd be repercussions. So absolutely, that's an important, but also, I mean, part of the goal is to have as many children as you can. So it's not an insidious plot to keep people in. It's also that it's a, it's a strategy for having big families and keeping orthodoxy going, which they've been doing very well. Um, in terms of numbers, again, I don't know. I heard lots of different numbers and I'm not sure. I know that within the past decade, there's been a lot of communal concern over um, doubt and about, the, about people leaving. Um, I think, interestingly, um, it is more men who leave. Um, I think, that's my sense. But sometimes women are more prepared to leave in terms of their schooling, which has always been interesting to me because um, not in every community and where Deborah Feldman is from, perhaps not in Satmar, but in many other communities, um, girls have a much stronger English education, uh, secular education more broadly than boys do. And so they are more familiar, they're better English speakers usually, they have more access to secular knowledge. Then again, um, once they have families, it's really, really difficult to leave. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, it, it's related to what you, you were discussing, but what is the main strategy of the ultra-drugs to cope with doubt in their community? And it's uh, related, another question is about the portrayal of doubt in the Netflix series Un Un Unorthodox. So uh, would you be able to answer those? Sure. Um, the portrayal of doubt um, is diverse, right? Like some, um, somebody I spoke to, and I heard this several times, um, said he was talking to a therapist and another person to a rabbi, and both times the, the person 
talking said, why can't you just keep your doubt to yourself and just keep practicing? Like, just do that. Everybody does that. So I think there is an acknowledgement, and that's the first kind of doubt I talked about. There is an acknowledgement that doubt is just part of religious life. But for most people, that doubt can stay inside and that doubt won't necessarily disrupt practice. I think all of the kinds of, it's coming a lot out of the therapeutic framework. There are, there are both, there's rabbis, outreach rabbis who minister to people with doubts, especially young adults. There are life coaches, that's a growing population um, who also minister to people who have doubts. And then there are therapists who don't usually treat people for doubt, but sometimes that becomes part of the bigger picture. And so I think that growing sort of whole complex of helpers and, and, and guidance and people, professionals who are there to help people resolve these doubts or at least figure out a way to live with them. One life coach that I spent time with said, I told this woman who had life-changing doubt, she didn't use life-changing doubt, but who, was, who didn't believe anymore, that's between you and God. Just stay home and stay with your family. That's what your job is to do. And the truth is it's still a mitzvah and you're fine. So there's a lot of tension around that. And I think it's ultra orthodoxy is kind of struggling with how to deal with that. And what about the portrayal of doubt and the uh, unorthodox, uh, the Netflix series? Yes. Um, in unorthodox, um, you have a a few different doubters, right? Um, you have the main character, Esty, based on Deborah Feldman's book, who, um, who really at least didn't seem like she was doubting until her life was so disappointing, which I have seen also many times, usually teenagers, and she was kind of unusual too. I guess she said that when she had her marriage, in, you know, that the show, the, the interview with her potential husband, she said, I'm not like everybody else. So I do think it's difficult for people who don't fit into that community. And if your marriage is, is disappointing or doesn't work out, that can be an impetus to actually leave. Um, I think in some ways, um, the character, I think his name is Moishi, the, the Hasidic hitman, um, in some ways is also sort of like somebody living a double life, except, except not really. I didn't meet any hit people. Um, but but he had gone in and out and in and out. And that's another pattern that I think is also common, but clearly someone who struggled with doubt also. Um, so you have different forms of doubt in unorthodox, which I think makes it especially interesting. And that leads to uh, really wonderfully to the next question. Did living double life feel like a sustainable plan for the future or did most of these individuals see themselves as likely leaving the derech at some point in the future? Or in other words, were some hoping the period of experimentation might help them return? Um, well, yeah, that's a really interesting question. So I think it's really difficult to live a double life, but I, I do know that some people continue to do that. I think they kind of find some kind of medium and through negotiating with their spouse and, with, and figuring out how to deal with the kids and their extended family sometimes. So there are people who are able to sustain this. In the time that I was doing field work, the people who I met early on, this was like a period of between five and seven years, the people I met early on, most of them were still living double lives by the end, but they had become much more, um, they more openly, for example, would text me on Shabbos, where they didn't in the beginning. Maybe they trusted me more too, but it seemed like people moved towards increasing leniency while they stayed in their community. Um, I'm sorry, Manja, what was the last part of your question? Uh, so the last part I have to go back to. Uh, in other words, with some of them hoping the period of experimentation might help them return. Oh, return, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I actually, well, um, was spent time with one person who did return for a while and then who returned and stopped living a double life. He attempted that and then he said, I went, I went in, I went back. Um, and then he came back to living a double life. I think a lot of people do that. It's, it's painful, it's difficult and people try again. I mean, a lot of men especially told me they wished they could regain their faith desperately, you know, that it was a more comfortable place. Um, but there are also people who would leave if they could, you know, um, I, I, I thought that um, 
initially I thought that many people just wanted to be secular. Well, that didn't turn out to be true. Um, ethnography showed me that in fact, there were people who really enjoyed that what they began to call the lifestyle of ultra orthodoxy. They appreciated the family time and the ties. But then there were people, and I actually wrote that to one of my uh, WhatsApp groups and, and somebody responded to me like, you know what, I would leave if I could, but I can't, I can't bear to hurt my parents like that. So there were people, and, and then there were people who tried and moved to other neighborhoods and really did experiment, like away from prying eyes and did experiment. I think the key was going slowly and in a way that didn't feel like it was rebellious because that kind of rebellion or pushback against authority figures is what really troubles, I think, a lot of um, rabbinic leadership. And that, again, beautifully segues mm -hmm. to the next question uh, coming from a, a attendee who left the Catholic Church after John Paul II became Pope and made, uh, and, and made some changes that the, uh, the attendee found against his or her personal beliefs. Were there any changes in leadership in the communities that we studies, that studied that were a catalyst to make people doubt? So about leadership and yeah, you that. Know, what a lot of people told me um, was that, um, especially for Hasidic Jews, was that the political struggles over secession, um, when the original Rebbe died, and then there were struggles between a son and an, and an in, a son-in-law, for example, that those kinds of um, political struggles which were really over power and wealth that comes with, and of course, religiosity too, but they were very open and um, some community, there were a lot of schisms in different Hasidic groups. Um, I think people told me that that really um, made them much more cynical. It made them cynical and not quite as um, in awe and not as willing to um, give up certain things because they felt that their Rebbe was their leader. One person said to me, you know, I just think like, who's my Rebbe? Like, he doesn't know much more than I do. So he's studied a little bit more, but he doesn't know very much. Why should I listen to him, you know? And so I think those kinds of political struggles that were open and even covered in the New York Times, for example, um, I think those were very disillusioning for people. Um, as were the kinds of difficulties of living in New York City, which is really expensive um, and, and hard. Um, sometimes lack of education was frustrating to people. Um, the kind of vilifying of Gentiles was frustrating too, to some. Um, and so I think that's why I, I think it's also generational. There is a generation, um, sometimes they're actually called the lost generation, um, because they came of age before the internet was really so tightly controlled. And so they had more access. Those were some of the earlier bloggers. Um, I think that was um, a group that was criticized for being cynical and mocking, um, but that they were really disillusioned. Your informants use the closet metaphor, uh, use the closet metaphor invites to a comparison between the closet of doubt and the closet of sexual orientation. Is that connection generative given the intersection of sexuality with crisis of faith across religious traditions? Yeah, that's a really interesting question and uh, I appreciate that. And I, I, I actually went back and forth a lot in how much I was gonna elaborate that in the book. Um, when I began to hear that in the closet, that, that came up more, more recently, I would say, um, the ITC, but um, I began to investigate that a little. Um, I think that if you discover that you're gay, and this is what people told me, that it's more likely that you might leave. I think it's harder to stay in the closet um, and live a double life uh, one woman said to me, it would be incredible, it was incredibly lonely to live like that, you know, to be in a marriage and not have love and, and be fulfilled in that way. Um, so I do think that some of that language of being in the closet is probably borrowed. Um, I will say that many people I worked with did not love the term double life. They thought it was too duplicitous. Um, I decided to use it anyway. I hope that they'll forgive me, but I decided to use it because I, I, it was the term that I heard most often. Uh, another term which was really fascinating to me was called reverse Muranos, 
Um, and that was a, a very particular group of people who were in the closet. Amarano is, um, a, were Jews uh, during the Spanish Inquisition who pretended to, con who converted, but uh, kept up Jewish uh, ritual secretly. And these people felt that they were the reverse of that, that they were forced to keep orthodoxy and in secret, they explored secular life. In, in Israel, I think those same people are called the Anusim, the forced. Um, and so, um, yes, the closet is generative. I don't think it reflects much about sexual orientation. Most of the people that I worked with um, were not queer. And it seemed to me like most of the people who were and had life-changing doubt left. I think you discovered that probably earlier, maybe. Um, but yeah. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions about comparison, how Americans this phenomenon and a comparison to the Haredi communities in Israel, uh, in Australia and Europe and, uh, and other places. Uh, so could you speak to those, uh, potentially yes. those comparisons? I'll try my best. That's a really good question too. And I actually think there's not enough work that crosses those national boundaries. A lot of the social science work on ultra-orthodoxy and orthodoxy has been sort of bounded by national um, boundaries to its detriment because the communities are really transnational. You know, they really span marriages are made across borders, businesses happen across borders, families go back and forth all the time. Um, it was hard for me to make connections in Israel. I had a few people I was talking to, a non-Hasidic um, man living a double life in Israel and I knew a few people in London, no one in Australia, um, some people in Belgium. So I know that there are parallel communities. They're smaller, um, at least in Europe. In Israel, I think it's large. I, I will say that there's a really different relationship in Israel that I think is super interesting um, with Haredim and the internet there. The ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Israel, because they control so much of the press, were able to outlaw the internet much more quickly and to control cell phone use. Um, they, they were able to do that in the early 2000s. I mean, there are plenty of Israeli Haredim who still have smartphones, but, but they, they were able to assert their authority, I think, more strongly. And in fact, that influenced ultra-Orthodox rabbis here who saw that as a model in some ways. But the states, there's much more variety and they're not as, um, as in control as I think uh, Haredi ultra-Orthodox uh, leadership is in Israel. And so that was much harder and I think it's an ongoing struggle. The internet is an interesting thing to track in terms of national differences. So we'll have to finish in a few minutes, but there are a couple of questions about your methods. So one, uh, there are a few people who are ask, asking how you were able to recruit your uh, your subjects uh, to to the research, and the other uh, one is about the language. Um, what uh, what did you speak with uh, to your interviewers? A mix of Yiddish, English. Um, uh, how would you describe that uh, language or range of linguistic expression? So, if you could yeah, speak great. to your methods Thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Um, so. I actually was not planning to do this project at all. I thought I was done studying ultra-orthodoxy. And um, I decided I had one more article that I wanted to do on Hasidic bloggers. That had been a phenomenon at the end of my, of my field work. And I was curious about that. But as I was doing a little extra research for that, um, to just write an article, um, I discovered that there was this group of people who were living double lives that I really hadn't been exposed to at all during my first research project. And I got really curious. And at that point, also, I would say then a year later, there was that huge city fields uh, rally against the, against the internet that happened in 2012. And I heard discourses of like a crisis of faith and things I had never heard before. And I got really intrigued. So when I got so interested, I contacted one person who I had known from my book and some of the bloggers too. And from then it was really like any other ethnography, you know, that one person introduces you to another person who introduces you to another person. Um, I think I was fortunate in that um, once people felt that I could be trusted to keep their anonymity, they were willing to talk to me, but it was really word of mouth and one person, like a snowball sampling, one person suggests another person. In terms of language, that was really interesting for me. So I learned Yiddish as an adult at 
the summer program of YIVO uh, when I was in graduate school and I learned it and then I did my field work and I mainly talked first grade Yiddish with little girls. The women I worked with ultimately didn't really speak much Yiddish so I was a great first grader. What I had to learn in talking to um, for this project was a, I, I spoke in English with with everybody. Um, you know everyone is pretty pretty fluent but I did have to learn a lot of terms that come from Lushen Koydish, that come from liturgical Hebrew, that I hadn't been exposed to that were religious terms. But men's Yiddish is so different from women's Yiddish, especially a certain register for studying Torah in, that there were many new words that I had to learn. And I was really fortunate. I hired uh, Rose Waldman, who's a Yiddish translator, and she helped me uh, work through some of the, the online Yiddish posts in different chat rooms that were written mostly by men because women don't usually write, Hasidic women don't usually write that much in Yiddish. A lot of that Yiddish was hard for me. It took me a long time to work through. So I hired her and she helped me translate those. Um, and I had a lot of people at my disposal who were able to help me when I was like, what is this word? Oh, it's a proclamation in Yiddish. Um, so that I had, a, I had to learn a whole new vocabulary and I was, it was much more about reading Yiddish for this project than about speaking it per se. I would say that when people were at parties, when, when Hasidic men were at parties and it had, you know, a few beers, the language reverted to Yiddish often. Um, and that was okay with me. That was fun. But I really spent, for the research part, I really had to read mostly. And that's where I was really fascinated to see that there was an emerging variety of um, what I call enlightened Hasidic Yiddish online, where people are expressing themselves um, in Yiddish, but self-expression and not so much as a, and, and for leisure, really, you know, and writing short stories and poetry. And I think that's a new variety of Yiddish that's emerging that is facilitated by the internet. Okay, the last question uh, is about, I mean, there are more questions, but we unfortunately won't be able to get to them, but it's about compa uh, comparing different uh, Haredi groups uh, and whether there are any groups that are more prone to going off the derech, whether uh, there is a place for uh, children of Bala Tshuva, for instance, or other Hasidic groups uh, that are more or less prone to, that you've seen in your research. Yeah. Um this project was different for me too because instead of studying just Hasidic women and their children, and my first book was about Babavar Hasidim in particular, um, I sort of followed people where they went. And I was exposed to both Hasidic ultra Orthodox and what are called yeshiva ultra Orthodox, as well as modern Orthodox therapists. There were many. Um, and so what I was interested in was all of these interactions and a lot of the internet, anti internet. Um, sort of strategies that were coming um, out were really started in Lakewood, I think. Um, there was a, you know, Yeshivish had more access to uh, the internet earlier on and, and they were more concerned about it earlier. So there was a real alliance between Hasidic and Yeshivish, the two different branches of Ashkenazic ultra-Orthodoxy. Um, I don't really name specific groups in my book and I do that to maintain people's anonymity. So I am going to uh, not really address that question. Okay, perfect. So uh, I want to thank uh, Ayala and Robert for uh, this wonderful conversation. And um, yeah. we, Ayala's uh, book is uh, available for sale as of this week, as of Tuesday this week. And uh, we have uh, a, a code, uh, if you order the book from Princeton University Press, uh, there is a 30% off co uh, code, capital A, capital F, for Ayala Fader, I assume 30 uh, for the percentage. So AF30, uh, and uh, you will be able to, um, to uh, get 30% off the book. So we all look forward to our summer reading. Thank you, Ayala. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you, Bob. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for coming out. Thanks.